And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. European countries have been following the U.S. and bailing out banks. Now Harper says he is prepared to do the same if needed. And given the lean, mean economic times, Harper continues to endure attacks over his decision to trim the arts. But, says a Toronto writer, real artists don't need grants. And a new Ontario bill to make it easier for doctors to apologize without legal implications. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. Reverend John Williams is founder of the Canadian Children's Rights Initiative and a political blogger. And you, the viewer, you are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time with any of your comments. Now, the first issue that we're talking about today, take a look at the headline. Europe races to shore up faltering banks. And since that, there's been some talk that Harper is, well, he's poised to do the same if necessary. Now, what I'm asking you, the audience, is to give us your comments on how you feel about the economy. You don't have to be an economist. Otherwise, well, the polls won't be open to you if you were, if, if that was the criteria. So we're not asking you to be an economist today. We're going to be discussing bits and pieces about the economy. But we want to know, how do you feel about the economy? Is it going to affect your decision at the voting polls? Feel free to call in with your comments at any time. Now, for the two of you, we're talking about the banks. And ever since the United States announced its $700 billion bailout, it ended up creating panic on the global front. Before you knew it, the world was in a tailspin. Markets started to fall. It hit Europe, it hit Russia, and it just kept on going. And now, we've been saying here in Canada that we were okay, but of course we know we're tied to the global economy. Many people were saying at the time, Germany started off saying, as a result of the $700 billion bailout, that they thought it was a mistake, but then they followed suit. Now, to start, I'd like to know what the two of you think to begin with. Should the banks, should the governments have become involved at all, beginning with the United States, in bailing out the banks? Do you think it was a good decision or a bad one? And I'm going to start with you on this one, Reverend Williams. Well, I think that it was a, a necessity, at least a perceived necessity on the part of legislators. They did what they believed to be what was necessary to help America and help the global economy. And, and that's, you know, I, so I think that they, they acted in, in good faith. But they, of course, there's a lot, much opposition, and it's a complex set of circumstances that you know I can't summarize in two seconds. But we'll talk about it some more. But it also has to do, John, with how capitalist you are, if you want to put it this way. Because on one hand, you hear people arguing, it, this is an, a, a free economy. Well, it, it's the world leader when it comes to capitalism. Why is the government getting involved? And yes, there are a lot of people speaking after the fact. Look what the U.S. government allowed to happen. There should have been more regulations when there are those at the same time that scream against regulation. So where do you stand on this? Well, you know th that my position is always the position of, of looking to the well-being and of, of children. And, and as a children's rights advocate, mm -hmm. uh, and as a person who pays attention to the, the condition of children worldwide and nationally and locally, I would say that, that really what I'm seeing here is the consequences uh, of, of kind of m bad moral behavior on the part of the, the global economic system. These are the, these are the, the negative consequences mm -hmm. at just at my level. When I look at the, the conditions of children, what I see is, is the banking system is like a giant trawler running through our, our shallows off Nova Scotia, disrupting and disturbing the entire, entire environment below and taking most of the fish and then you know, discarding what is not necessary. It looks like that. And I'll give you an example. So you think the financial institutions are greedy? That's your premise here? Well, I'm not, no, I'm not even pointing at their greed. I mean, that, that's their whole purpose in, in existing, the greed. It's, it's more the way that... <laughs> the, the, it's more the way the... Uh, that greed is being expressed at, and the consequences and negative impact it's having on children who are being exploited worldwide in order to support this economic and financial system. Mm -hmm. Paul, you're feeling on this. Uh, the, no. The intervention by yeah. government. No, it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. It's a hair of the dog. You know, uh, mm -hmm. a drunk has gone out and gotten drunk, feels really horrible and is begging for some mercy. And we're asking, should the government give him a a couple shots of uh, gin in the morning so that he doesn't have to feel the pain, knowing full well that tonight that drunk's going to be out doing it again. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're setting them up so that this horrible uh, financial situation can get even worse. We're prolonging and worsening the situation. And really, the root of all of it is not 
necessarily just making credit easier to get for people who can't afford it. But uh, the whole system that we've had, I mean, we had this very crisis in the 1930s. And six very good economists from Chicago said to uh, Roosevelt at the time, uh, look, what you need to do is make sure that banks don't lend out the money that they don't have on deposit. It's the fractional reserve system uh, where banks are allowed to create almost as much credit as they want. In Canada, there is no reserve limit. They can make as much credit as they want. And their only fear is whether or not someone's going to come and ask for their deposits to be turned into currency. Yes, I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked John. Do you yeah. think the financial institutions were being greedy? Uh, or, as he put it, that's what they do. That's I, what they're in business for. Well, they're, they're in business to make profits. Um, I think they were, they were allowed to do which, that which they ought not to be doing, but which they have always been permitted to do, which is to make as much money as they want in the form of credit, lend it out, collect interest on it. They should instead be saying, I'm borrowing from the depositor and lending that money out to someone else while the depositor is not permitted to withdraw it. And that way, there's no stretching out of this, uh, you know, this making of phony money, money that can be uh, subject to a crisis. Instead, mm -hmm. we're just lending at interest and uh, you have a relatively stable economy. Mm -hmm. Keep the money supply even, don't allow these fluctuations, these ex uh, expansions and contractions, and you won't see the nightmare that we're going through mm -hmm. right now. John, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to take things back a step even further beyond the 1930s to 1929 when, when the market oh. crashed. Great depression. And, and you know, my father was there in the midst of that. In fact, at that, at that time, my father happened to be uh, a member of the household of the, the richest man in this country, a guy who owned a gold mine, the richest gold mine in the country, and that's the guy who raised my father. And that's why my father could become the, the Canadian champion boxer and get the best training in the world and go to the Olympics and, and so forth. It's because this man was financing him. And, and Well, tell us who your dad was, John. Uh, my dad was uh, Howard Williams, Kid Williams. Uh, he was the Canadian welterweight champion and represented Canada in, in the Olympics and was the, the British Empire champion. Uh, he was a very nice man, a gentleman, well turned out and, uh, you know, well-mannered uh, and very smart. He, and he, he told me a story that I think is relevant to all this, if I may just take a moment, uh, that in 1932, uh, his mentor and kind of almost adoptive father, Sir Harry Oakes, was called to a meeting of the, of the House of Lords in Britain, along with industrialists and capitalists from Western nations. There they agreed together to support a new up-and-coming leader in Germany named Adolf Hitler, and they did through the war. Mm -hmm. Now, the same banks and the same people and the same families and the same institutions are involved in this collapse as we're in that. And my concern for young people is that the same solution will be found that was found then. Let's make war and make more money wow. and, and reduce the problem. Wow. You got a point, but I think... Yeah, it's a small point. It, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a big one, actually. It's a very large point. But, but the issue is here. We're faced with a crisis, and we know what the financial institutions should not have done, but they did. Hence comes government should the, who's going to regulate these people if it's not government who's going to police these people well but the, you don't believe in government intervention here well the, the, what's going to police them is if it's allowed to do so uh, the natural forces of the market the free market in other words them, so to speak well it, it does but it, <laughs> yes. and it's, and it's inescapable nothing the government mm -hmm. can do can actually beat the mother nature of economics that we can pretend we can blame Stephen Harper or whoever we want but and that's fact, the key here that's, that's what's going on here yeah, and, and it's, 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 it's entirely unfortunate that this um, what's going on in the stock markets right now might cause voters to make the gravest political error uh, in many years in that uh, ballot box I cannot stress uh, strongly mm -hmm. enough that to vote on the basis of what you know uh, two or three of the party leaders are saying is this big catastrophe you better do something what they want to do is to add in insult to injury. They are looking for an excuse for a massive, massive indebtedness of the government. Um, thousands of dollars per person that they would put us into debt for these crazy uh, schemes that they're proposing. The NDP have been waiting for an opportunity to blame it on the banks. Now they've got one. And if people are buying that, uh, that line, there's going to be something very unfortunate happens on voting day. Now the bottom line is, hold that thought, Reverend Williams, because we're going to have to go for a break. But the point of the matter is, you're the ones watching. You're the ones that are going to be going out to vote at the polls. Even though we might be getting into the details of economic discussion, politics here, we want to know what your point of view is. It's important, so don't be shy to call in. Are you angry about what you see happening in the economy? And where are you putting that blame? We want to hear from you. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're talking about the economy. How are you feeling about it? Is this going to affect your choice when you go out to the polls next Tuesday? Let us know how you feel as we discuss this issue. Now, you were about to say something, and I asked you to hold on. Yes. Tell well, us. Well, it is, certainly is going to affect the, the, me when I go to the polls, yes. and I'm going to vote liberal, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, part, of, part of the kind of financial strain that we're experiencing right now is uh, the industrial base is weakened and Mr. Dion has a plan to strengthen that through kind of green technology and the development uh, uh, investment in R&D. These are very important components to the future of our economy. Uh, that's one reason. The other major reason that I'm going to support the Liberals is because they are one of two uh, parties in this country, the other being the Bloc Québécois, that has a real kind of plan for the well-being of children. Now, as you know, once again, I support children and their well-being, and part, part of the, the problem here with Mr. Harper from this point of view is that he wants to incarcerate children, and I find that abominable. In fact, I've called that legislative child abuse, and I don't think that I would support someone who would do a thing like that. I know I would not. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Decep. Uh, express that more clearly than any other. But, but on the more positive side, the Liberals have a plan that, that takes into account where, ch where young people are today and is more of a voice for them. In fact, he has been saying that we should vote not only for ourselves, but for our children. That is to build a strong economy through green development. Incarcerate children, though. You're talking about young offenders here, and I'd like to hear what your point of view would be on that, how well, Harper's dealing with the young offenders. Because I, I know there's some applauding him, saying, look, these kids could be awfully violent tear apart victims' lives. Uh, and, of course, victims' rights people would come, up, come out and problem. say, well, and, they're saying poverty we is the problem, that. but I know a lot of poor yeah. people that don't engage in that kind of violent behavior as well. Agreed. So this is something that's ongoing. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think it's fair to people who don't have a lot of money to say that people commit crime because they're poor. I don't think it's uh, right uh, to blame people because they're mm -hmm. bored. Uh, it's a moral crisis. It's not necessarily in uh, economic or boredom. You can't just make someone a good person by putting a basketball court in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when we're talking about incarceration under this new proposal by the Conservatives, we're talking about very violent individuals. Mm -hmm. um, these are exceptional cases, not mainstream. I don't think we're talking about shoplifting, you know, kids who engage in shoplifting or vandalism. We're talking about kids who are involved in murder. So that is a different deal, and I, uh, I have some sympathy for that. I, I'm not affiliated with any of the federal parties. Mm -hmm. I'm clearly voting uh, for justice, and um, I don't think that, that that means I have to um, uh, be in favor of uh, a massive uh, layout of money. I don't think welfare mm -hmm. is the answer to crime. Well, the massive layout of money is exactly what it's going to require to build all the prisons that are going to be involved in, in the future of, of uh, law enforcement in this country. And, and, uh, I believe that we have to kind of get to the, to the root of the problem. I'm not blaming people for being criminal because the, many, many wealthy mm -hmm. people are, are even worse criminals, let's face it. Th that's not what I'm pointing at. I'm pointing at that, that there are some realities. The real politic of the person on the street with no money is You see, that, that's a major issue here. Yeah. The money with the people on the street. I, I think that's the one thing that's driving the elections this time. The money and Absolutely. people's insecurity about the economy. We want to hear what you have to say on the phone lines. Let's go now to you, Maureen, on line four from Alberta. Hello, Maureen. You're on the line. I don't blame anyone. It's worldwide, and it's inevitable. It's getting closer to those days the Bible speaks of, when there will be one world government, one world bank, a cashless society, no trading or selling unless you take the 666 number. Maureen, thanks for calling in and sharing that. Well, Maureen, from the point of view of not blaming anybody, she doesn't blame anybody. And from people are passing blame. People are passing blame, and... Just by looking at the polls, how Harper at one point was poised to win a majority. You know, Ever since this fiasco in the yeah. economy, the polls have registered something quite the opposite. The thing is that the banking system that is failing right now is the exact same one that we've had since the, the 1930s. Uh, the monetary policy we have right now is the exact same one that we've had since the 1980s brought in by not just conservatives but by liberals to suggest that this was all caused within the last two and a half years or however long the conservatives have been in power is ridiculous um, and I know that people are afraid people but are. I think mm -hmm. and, and you know I don't think it's the role of a prime minister at that point to sit down take out his hanky and go oh I'm feeling for you 
the, the, the proper role of a prime minister is to say, I'm not going to let my emotions get the better of me. I need to hold up things for you. Okay. I need to show you that this economy is not as bad as the fear mongers would have, it, have you believe it is, and that there's no reason to go switching gears and rushing headlong into a spending spree when, in fact, it's economically impossible to reverse a worldwide crisis by spending in Canada $800 million or whatever the Liberals or, or NDP want to spend. It is just opportunism on the left. They're trying to say that, you know, all those billions or millions we wanted mm -hmm. to spend, let's spend them now and that'll fix things. Well, that has nothing to do, their spending plans have nothing to do with repairing the economic system mm -hmm. because they cannot do so. It's mm -hmm. like throwing pebbles in, a, in, a, in Lake Ontario and but saying, But Harper you're is fill getting it. the blame. It, it, it seems to be. Whoever's in power, in the polls. whoever's in power, yes. whoever's in power will mm -hmm. always get the blame. It's not right. that they're conservative or liberal; it's that they're mm -hmm. the ones in power. And if you're afraid, you want to blame the government. Whoever's in power, right? It was Sorry. FDR who who actually did a lot of spending in order to shore up the American economy before the Second World War. Of course, the war was the real bonus financially, but but. Prior to that, you know, they built the Hoover Dam, they built the, the, the interstate highway system. Many things were done during this, during this period that was spending for the sake of the citizens and the, and the evolution, development, and, and strengthening of the economy. And that's essentially what Mr. Dion is talking about. I mean, this is not alarmist behavior. I know the man. He's not, he's not alarmist. He's very calm, and he's smarter than most people. And, 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 and caring. Yes, he is caring, and I'm not as dispassionate as you are. I do feel for the person on the street. Uh, and in the bank. Oh, so do I. Everybody's Quite suffering right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, but again, I'd like to reframe the whole thing and point out, I just want to be a little bit more clear about my perspective on what's going on here. The mm -hmm. collapse, for me, is due to the... I mean, in the, in the 18th, 17th, and, and, and 1600s, there was, a, there was a, a global economic system that was based upon the enslavement of African people. Now we're enslaving children and using them, and this is the moral okay, failure. But, but who, do you, who do you blame here? For the everybody. downfall of the economy. All of us, we all well, have yeah, to but change. you're being fair in saying everybody because yeah. people obviously spent more than they could have afforded, which is what started the whole thing from the states. But you see, Stephen Harper is the one now getting the blame for this. Yeah, no, it's it's not Stephen mm -hmm. Harper's fault. It's not the it's not Jean Chrétien's fault. It's not even Pierre Trudeau's fault. It goes back much further. I would blame government. I wouldn't blame any, any particular party because it's all of them have been involved in it. They're all in favor of keeping the system as it is even after this election, and that is allowing banks to issue as much money as they want, lend it out, and take some chances, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll be able to honor our debts as they come due. That's Before we problem. go for a break, let's go now to Nini on line 8. Hello, Nini. You're on the line. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I just want to make a comment about that gentleman who was accusing the um, incarceration of children. He said that this is terrible. Children have to be incarcerated if they are disobeying the law, breaking the law. For instance, if they are murdering or kidnapping people. What's he talking about? I mean, children, if they don't get properly disciplined, they're going to grow up into a, a menace to the society. Mm -hmm. Nini, thank you for your call. Reverend Williams, do you care to no, respond I'm, to this? I, I, don't, I don't disagree that when people are uh, being, uh, you know, when they're being criminal, that they should pay the consequences. What I'm saying is that before that, we have an opportunity in terms of education and in our, our, our organizations and institutions in our society to try to prevent this from happening on such a wide scale. In fact, the, the criminal uh, rates and levels are, are decreasing in Canada. And I'd just like to respond if, at, uh, while I have an opportunity to, uh, to the, the credit and while well, Many people here, both of you, are concerned about too much disgrace falling on Mr. Harper. But, and I'm, I'm not trying to put disgrace on Mr. Harper. He's my prime minister. Okay? In, the, in, fact, in spite of the fact that I'm a liberal, he's my prime minister as a Canadian. What I, well, I will say is that the reason that this conservative government can be so stable and calm is that because 10 years ago, uh, Mr. Martin and Mr. Kretschmer and others, including Mr. Dion, took the time to get our fiscal house in order. They paid down the debt, they created a lot of stability from which this conservative government is benefiting. And that's the Canadian government. I have no b beef with that. We're all benefiting, but because Mr. Martin and the Liberals did so much to, c to stabilize the economy Paul, while they were in power. I want you to respond power. to that. And of course, you, the viewer. So stay tuned. We'll get right back to you after this. Stay tuned.
again. Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line, continuing to talk about our first subject matter, and that is related to the economy. We want to know how you feel about it. Is it going to affect what you do at the polls? Let's go now to you, Lorraine, on line one. Hello, Lorraine, you're on the line. Hi, Christine. Uh, my comment was regarding um, the incarceration of young people. If um, Reverend Williams look around the world, he'll notice that if there's an increase Am I there? Yes, Am I we're listening to you, Lorraine. Okay, if you look, you look around the world, you'll notice that there's an increase in violent crimes amongst young people. I had a conversation with a family member, like I'm orig originally from the Caribbean, and her concern was the increase in crime in that area amongst young people and very, very violent crime. So mm -hmm. if uh, Reverend uh, Williams is looking worldwide and his concern is for young people, he will notice that, you know, crime has increased violently amongst these people. Lorraine, you, you got a great comment there. Thanks for calling in. You hit a nerve there, John. Well, I don't mind doing that. Um, I've been, I mean, I'm a minister, so that's, that's my job, is to hit nerves, uh, not only bad <laughs> ones. I, I, I know that there's much uh, an increase in violence worldwide, and, but I also know that the violence is not confined to children, that the children are copying. I mean, people are putting M16s in their hands and forcing them to be soldiers and child slaves. I mean, these are not entirely the decisions of children. They're being caught up in an economic global system that is really... Up I'll give you an example. In, in the Congo, they mine a particular metal, an element that I can't, I can't remember the name of it, but it's essential for every cell phone. Every cell phone must have this. Children there are being slaughtered. Three million people have been mur murdered in the war. People are fleeing by the thousands John, yesterday. I understand your point. We've got to move yeah. along here, though, and, and to make it more relevant to this subject matter that we're talking about economics. Yeah. Let's face it. The world is at a point now where we're facing an economic scare. Crisis. A, a crisis. And there is a tie-in here, because when that happens, you do see a surge in crime. Well, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, we focus, we tend to focus but on... But blaming Harper... Yeah. It was an issue we were on. Yeah, and, and I think we, we tend to focus on, that's right, we, we tend to focus on, uh, you know, what about the poor person who's murdered someone? Well, you know, I say, you know, not only the victims, what about the people who aren't involved in a crime at all, not as a victim, not as a perpetrator? Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. trying to get ahead in life, they're trying to learn and li live happy, productive lives, and here we are suggesting that it's somehow compassionate to give money to the, you know, to the guy who would otherwise be a murderer, but we're not thinking about the fact that that money is coming out of the education, mouths, uh, 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 you know, future funds and, and, and lifestyle of the children who are doing well. I don't think it's compassionate, I don't think it's a love of, of, of children to deny those who are doing well so that we can you know, mm -hmm. fund those who are doing evil. I mm -hmm. think that we have to have more regard for the good in people. We really ought to be focused on making society good for the good, rather than focusing all of our attentions and energy on f how to turn the bad into the good. You know, we should be making good people better more so than making bad people somewhat good. And we're going to have to get back to the phone lines now. Dahlia on line four. Hello, Dahlia. You're on the line. Go ahead, Dahlia. Um... What I want to know, what I want to say is, we always trying to blame our governments. We should be praying for them, for God to give them wisdom to govern this blessed country that he has given us. Mm -hmm. Delia, thanks for calling in with that comment. Let's go now to Georgette on line seven. Hello, Georgette, you're on the line. Yeah, hello, yeah. I want to say, because I am glad this country you have a lot of, you know, you see the welfare people, again, you don't feel hungry, again. But I blame for people, this teenager, what I'm doing, this kind of stuff. This is making, he wants to make fast rich. He wants to make more money. This is reason not to poor, not poor people, this is. This is reason you have to punish this kind of people to leave another right people, leave free, the freeway. Mm-hmm. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I, I want to comment that, that this, this crisis that we're facing right yes. now did not come as a surprise to me. Um, I've been preparing for this for a number of years. In fact, I've written and published a set of essays called Building the Canadian Dream, which is available on my blog. You can probably see it on the screen or on my website, mm -hmm. blindmansees.com, because I used to be blind. Um, and 
what, uh, what I'm talking about is not just a, a fiscal or, or economic response. I'm talking about, in, in those essays, about, about a national response. People of all persuasions working together for a set of, of goals that will serve not only us, but, but take the Canadian culture, which I consider to be remarkable. John, what about the carbon tax? Yeah. That's been one that people have been fearful yeah. of. Well, I, I understand that, that and, and I can understand why they would be. I'm not afraid of it. And, and the reason is that, that uh, I'm aware that the environment is being really eroded because of the way we're living right now. We have to put a price on carbon. This is, it, I mean, all economists of all persuasions basically agree with that. Some want to wait. And, and, Mr. and uh, Mr. Layton wants to impose a certain kind of system, but, but a group of, uh, of scientists, 200 of our best scientists and over 80 of our, of our economists are, are supporting this plan because it gives us an opportunity to enter into the global trade market and, and, and to begin to meet our responsibilities as a nation in terms of lowering our pollution. And, and this is w one of the sad consequences of, it, of uh, the way we live. One of the best arguments against the carbon tax was just made, that it will involve us with all of these other countries that currently are engaged in huge financial crisis. Mm -hmm. That's all uh, countries. Well, exactly. Not us. <laughs> today, today, it was released, I think I believe it was World Bank or, I can't, mm -hmm. or IMF, had released a study showing that Canada is the number one uh, banking country in the world. The banks are top in all of the world. Mm -hmm. We are not even in a recession. They're talking depression in the United States and in these various other countries. Yes. Iceland yes, talking are. bankruptcy. Yes. I'm quite happy with uh, the way things are going in Canada. I'm not fearful uh, as people should be in other places. And um, I think that this carbon tax, however, will intertwine us with countries that have made horrible mistakes and will drag us down with them. I say we've we've done a very good job okay I, i'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that. okay you, you, to yeah but we to gotta this. go for a break and here's a <laughs> thought for both of you to consider it <laughs> seems like this late in the game when it comes to the elections we have been hit all of a sudden the economy has been hit at a point where no one expected people are in a panic people want to hear some soft kind words but they also need to see a strong plan we want to hear what your thoughts are who you believe can deliver it we'll be back after this stay tuned Hello again. Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Let's go straight to you on the phone lines now. Ted on line four. Hello, Ted. You're on the line. Oh, good afternoon, Christine. Good afternoon. Just a very quick comment. No politician is to blame for the current economic situation. Uh, certainly not Mr. Harper and uh, no other politician. Uh, nor is Mr. Harper the savior of the economy. Our economy was doing really well under the Liberals, so Mr. Harper is not the steady hand on the rudder like he'd like everyone to believe. And the reason Mr. Harper is falling in the polls is because the majority of Canadians are left of center, and Mr. Harper is the only right-wing party, okay, that is running. So Mr. Harper's ideology is not shared by the majority of Canadians, and that's becoming abundantly evident as this campaign goes. Dad, I've got one question to ask you. I, I, I'm not going to argue with anything you said there. It sounded fair enough, but what do you attribute this to? The fact that Harper at one point was looking like, according to the polls, like he was going to win a majority. What reason do you give to that? Well, I think Canadians really start to pay attention when it gets down to the last final two weeks of the, of the, uh, of the election. Plus, the things that Mr. Harper has done, such as going on a CBC program, but not playing by the same rules as other leaders. For example, not accepting questions from the public, but only a one-on-one -on -one interview with a CBC interviewer, does not sit well with Canadians. They don't see it as open. They don't see it as honest. Ted, and thanks for calling in, because there's something I want to pick up on that point. You made a great point here, because according to everything I, I've been reading, Harper is perceived, whether or not it's true, he's perceived as someone that's a little out of touch with the general public, maybe a little too calm, too collected, from the point of view of some people are not feeling that sense of assurance at a time like this, perhaps, when they're feeling a sense of panic. And I'd like you to comment on this one. Yeah. You'll get yours too, John. Yeah. Actually, uh, for a prime minister, as opposed to an opposition leader, I mm -hmm. want someone who seems a little less uh, uh, compassionate, emotional. I want someone who when everyone else is running around with like chickens with their heads cut off, says, calm down, things are fine. You need that. It's not only good uh, prime ministerial uh, behavior, it's necessary in an economy that's built largely on trust,
Is it seen as cold, though? And that's what I'm wondering, whether the public it, is seeing it as cold as opposed to... I don't think so. I think that mm -hmm. we had just days ago, I believe it was October 2, that's how recent it was, that Harper was poised to win not just a majority, yes, yes. but a huge majority. A sweeping one, yes. Yeah. It's not that the Canadians are... I mean, let's face it, these Conservatives are not the Reformers. They're not even the Alliance. They're ver pretty much the old PCs. They, they, and if you look at the policies of the Liberals and Conservatives, they're pretty much the same with the exception of the sweeping carbon tax. Mm -hmm. So th any, I think by now that kind of feeling, that fear about the old reform policies is gone. What really has hit him in the numbers is precisely stock market fears. That's all it is. Yes. And he could have been Liberal, Green, NDP, yes. and it would have hit him the exact same mm -hmm. way. It's not that he's Conservative, it's that he's in power.